If you want to know how likely it is for Tesla to achieve 50% growth in vehicle production, you need to follow closely their development of the new 4680 batteries. So today we have a Tesla insider who's recently shared information that leads us to believe that Tesla's 4680 battery ramp is now progressing nicely. This has massive implications for vehicle scaling in 2024 and 2025. We'll dive deeper, not only in the importance of the battery, but also how this will affect the Cybertruck ramp. So we have Hans Nelson joining us. Hans has his own YouTube channel called Hans C. Nelson. Thank you so much, Hans. Thanks for having me, Herbert. This is great. You are going to help me understand better the 4680 battery. So this is the first thing we found out here. So my Tesla weekend, this is Brian White. He has his own YouTube channel and he posted this. He said last week he was at an Oregon EV Association meeting. <clears throat> And then a service center employee and former 4680 tech at Cato Road, Jen Goody, shared what it was like working there. <clears throat> okay, fantastic talk. But of course, she was very tight-lipped about the actual tech. We tried this couch and skirt to get insights, but she was on to us. What she would share, not once, but twice, <clears throat> was that if you wanted to know what's really going on with 4680, you need to watch The Living Factor. So Jordan Gasigi has his own YouTube channel called the, the Limiting Factor, and she wouldn't say more than that, but it was delightful to see someone who really knows what's going on with being such a fan of the Watt Master himself. So this is the video she's likely referring to, and you've uh, taken some screenshots and you can explain what is it you think that she's saying. What's your thoughts, bro? Uh, Hans? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, Jordan obviously has been making videos about 4680s for quite a while. And I am assuming that, you know, one of the things that Jordan does is at the end of each quarter, he gives us an update on where it looks like progress is. And so this one is the most recent video that he put out, um, I think a couple of weeks ago. And it goes through his assessment, breaking down what were the announcements that were made on the Q3 earnings call, and what are the implications of that for a 4680 battery ramp? And he made quite a few predictions and assumptions. And so I just wanted to go through what are the most important things that he talked about in that video briefly. I highly recommend that everyone just go watch that video in full. You'll get a much broader picture. And one of the things that Jordan does a great job of is he tells you, okay, you know, this is best case scenario of what might happen. This is what his expectations are. And then this is worst case scenario. Um, we're going to look at what I think the likely implications are here and dig into that. So the first most important thing that um, Drew mentioned on the earnings call was that, yeah, they are going at 40% quarter over quarter at that point in time. Um, and if you go back in time to when this first actually started ramping in Texas, what Jordan is extracting, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide, um, is that there is an average of a 21% month over month improvement rate. If you go back to October of 2022, um, and then you move forward to the uh, the 20 million cells that were just produced there in October mm -hmm. of this year. And so if we take that um, and project that forward, that's one of the, the things that he's saying in this video that he thinks the 20-ish percent, probably 21% is what it's been, rate is the steep part of the S-curve ramp for mm. this first phase of 4680 production. Um, and so we should be able to continue to see roughly that amount of growth every month. And that's what we've seen consistently now for, for a little while um, moving forward. And that is, uh, is we're pushing towards this thousand gigawatt hours per year of battery production globally. The cost that they're shooting for is also $70 per kilowatt hour. Um, and so we have an idea of cost that we're targeting. And once again, these are statements made by, uh, this article was coming out of, I think the Q3 earnings call that, uh, Ava was reporting on that. That's what Tesla had announced there. Was, 
Um, they didn't give a specific time frame on when this thousand gigawatt hours would be achieved or when they would actually reach the $70 per kilowatt hour target. Um, but that was that was their goal. And so moving on from there into the Q3 earnings call, we also saw that Drew talked about um, right now we are currently ramping four total lines at Giga Texas. And that's where we're seeing that 21% month over month improvement. But you can imagine that eventually we're going to get to the point where those lines have reached full capacity and they will no longer be able to continue providing that 21% growth. And so Drew said that they're actually moving into phase two. They're getting ready to set up the mm -hmm. uh, another four lines in Texas. And so the first four lines have a nameplate capacity of 100 gigawatt hours. The second four lines are also going to have a nameplate capacity of 100 gigawatt hours. And then if you move on, um, it, in Nevada, they've also talked about having wow. a goal of 100 gigawatt hours. And so just between the 200 gigawatt hours that they're planning for Giga Texas and the 100 in Giga Nevada, we're looking at shooting for total of 100 or of 300 gigawatt hours of 4680 specific battery cell production just here in the United States. So that doesn't include 2170s. That does not include um, 18650s from Japan. That doesn't include any LFP packs for any vehicles or battery storage products. Um, and so that's where we see overall the, um, the plans that Tesla is laying out and how they're executing towards that. And as we move uh, a little bit further into the, um, go ahead and, oh, I think we skip that one for right now. We'll come back to this one in just a second. Yeah, right here. So you can see that that 21% improvement, if you run that all the way out to the end of Q4 of 2024, that on the bottom right hand side, you see the run rate in gigawatt hours per year. We're still only at 74.2 mm. gigawatt hour run rate per year. Um, and so the the second four lines at Giga Texas, that's probably about when they're going to want to be starting, getting those lines running. So right now they're doing the prep work. And so commissioning, we should expect to start somewhere in that general vicinity so that they can continue to, and if you move on to the next slide, you can see you've got the phase one ramp there, that this is where we're at. We're in the steep part down uh, right at the bottom where it kind of goes into a consistent slope. So that's right about where we are, somewhere down in here. And we're looking forward at the end of that blue section being somewhere around the end of 2024 where it starts to taper off for those original four lines in texas and then that's where we expect to start layering in the phase two mm -hmm. production and continuing growth and then beyond that there would also be giga nevada behind it growing overall cells supply and so that really should account for probably um, cell growth of 4680s going into 2025, uh, maybe even 2026 between phase one and phase two in Texas and then phase three in Nevada. Um, one of the things that I did is I actually pulled in some implications of what actually that would look like for, if we assume that all of those 4680 cells are going to be allocated to the Cybertruck for the time being, which also seemed to be implied by Drew in the earnings call, um, that ends up putting us at having enough cells. It's hard to know what the average pack size is going to be. So it, just kind of have to take a guess. You know, there have been some people think that average and Jordan's position is that it's probably going to be about 135 kilowatt hour pack is the average for the Cybertruck. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen yeah. others that mm -hmm. think that the top range version is going to be as big as 250 kilowatt hour um, maximum. So that, that wouldn't be an average. Um, so I just played it safe and I estimated that we would have an average pack size around 170 kilowatt hours 
And um, when I ran all the same math that Jordan had laid out in his chart, but I kept it going forward into 2025, it looks like we'll have, um, yeah, right here. It looks like we'll have cell capacity of to to actually meet 250,000 cyber trucks per year somewhere in the end of Q3 or beginning of Q4 in 2024. And this is, like I said, just can, assuming that we, we stay constant on that 21% um, month over month improvement. And then the second implication is that we actually reach that 300-ish gigawatt hours of 4680 production, somewhere crossover point of, yeah, like somewhere right in the middle of Q3 of 2025. And so I think these are these are the types of assumptions that are probably being validated right now by like, this is Tesla's internal plans. This is how things seem to be going. And this is reflective of what they see the 4680 ramp looking like. And you can tell that, so, I mean, that 300 gigawatt hours, if we hit that in the middle of 2025, that's going to be a lot of extra cell supply beyond what is needed just for Cybertruck. And so that allows for a lot further ramping of Model Y and Model 3, if that's the direction that they want to go, or if they want to start allocating those cells to the next gen product. Um, it could also fill in there. We could see a ramp up of potentially the semi. Um, which would be a great fit as far as, I mean, they would need to be starting on getting those manufacturing lines rolled out um, for the high production of the Tesla Semi pretty soon in order for that to be the case. Uh, we do know that, you know, they're working on the lines for the next gen product there at Giga Texas. So, you know, that one also makes a lot of sense. But the thing about the next gen vehicles, I really do expect that to probably be a structural LFP pack. Um, and so unless they are, and that was one of the other things that um, Drew mentioned at the conference call, was they want to get Cato Road. Cato Road was making, it seems like, all of the 4680 cells that went into the 4680 Model Y that was produced in Austin. Um, and so they've shut down that. And, they're, and that's one of the reasons they took that vehicle away. And now they're retooling Cato Road for it to go back to being a development platform so that they can test out different chemistries. I think they want to install manufacturing equipment in Cato Road that basically they have figured out now in Giga Texas. And now they just want to use, now that they've got the process in place, they want to use that facility to test out chemistry improvements so that they can push the envelope. You know, we're seeing like 260 kilowatt hour uh, or watt hours per kilogram um, energy density there. And I think with chemistry improvements, we expect to see that push closer to 280, 290, potentially even 300 um, on those. And that work will be done at Cato Road. But the other option is they could be working on an LFP chemistry in a 4680 form factor that wow. would make a lot of sense um, for the next gen vehicle, especially you know, if they're producing those cells there in Austin, they can allocate one or two or even more of those lines in Texas to an LFP chemistry. Then you've got the battery cell manufacturing right there. Um, you can assemble your structural packs for the next gen vehicle and you can produce a very inefficient or I mean inexpensive um battery pack. And that's where we kind of come into, if we can go back to that slide that was in the middle about uh, impact on vehicle cost for the 4680s. So assuming that we are looking at, and this I think was a 75 kilowatt hour pack, that you're talking about savings if you get from where they are now at about $120, $130 per kilowatt hour down to $70 per kilowatt hour in the late 2024, 2025, 2026 timeframe, then you're saving $3,000, I think it is, yeah, on the on the pack cost. So that's the third line down there, yep. Mm -hmm. And then if you layer the IRA tax incentives on top of that, that's where you get the 64 
hundred dollar total savings, which really that cuts the cost of your battery pack in half, which is the vast majority of the cost of goods sold. Is, I mean, that's the single largest component of cost of goods sold for these EVs. And so not only for the Cybertruck, but especially for the next gen vehicle, um, you can see pack costs that are essentially at parity, if not lower than the ICE drivetrain in traditional legacy automotive manufactured vehicles, um, which really makes them super, super competitive. Um, this is fantastic news. So what you've basically said here is that it looks like, you know, looking at Gordon, Jordan Gasigi's uh, evaluation, we are here. So, you know, it took us a long time, slow mm -hmm. growth. There was a lot of work they had to do. They had to refactor what they initially thought the 4680 was. We were all fairly disappointed. We thought it was going to come sooner. But at least at this point, it looks like that they're expanding the production lines. They're expanding uh, different factories to be able to produce this. And, you know, we're, we're that's what his big point is, that we're basically here now. You know, we figured it out. We're moving fast. And then what you've just said, which is a big deal, enough for the Cybertruck for sure. Maybe by next year, even some extra that they can now do for the Model Y. Beyond cost savings, there's all sorts of other benefits for the Ford 680, right? So this is going to be just incredibly important. We had to wait a little bit, but now it's here. Yep. And everything that, you know, vehicle growth in general, and even energy storage growth, you know, that all depends on the growth of battery cell supply. And so, you know, we're growing cell supply in LFP from suppliers like CATL. Um, but Tesla's in-house is also a big part of that, and especially for any of the larger, more energy uh, demanding products. And the other thing is, you know, Elon says 250,000 Cybertrucks is kind of their goal. Mm -hmm. I expect personally that it's going to be much more than that. They're going to see that the demand continues to stay strong all the way through 250,000 vehicles per year, and they will continue to add manufacturing capacity once they see that, yes, like there's plenty of demand left for this vehicle at the prices that we can afford to sell them for and have make, uh, you know, have those things make a healthy margin. Um, and so that's the other piece in all of this is that we could very well see cyber trucks ramping to 300, 400, 500,000 units per year instead of being maxed out at that 250,000. And the cell supply should be there for that to be feasible. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com. Okay. That's big news. Obviously, at one point we had uh, Elon and the team say that they're no longer battery constraint. But then, of course, last year, I think most of us saw that uh, it was a slowdown. We were concerned. Good news is that it looks like that they've solved it. This is getting ramping back up again. And 4680 is incredibly important for all sorts of reasons. You've got to watch uh, Jordan's videos, Living Factor, to really understand that better. But it's very important for Tesla. Thank you so much, Hans, for explaining this to me. I think it's good news. And I you know, needed to understand this better. So thank you. Follow Hans on YouTube at Hans C. Nelson. He's got great videos. He interviews folks as well. You got to check him out. Thanks, everybody.